going to uh, move on to our second uh, speaker today. I hope Andre is on the call already. Hello, everyone. Hi there. Hi there. So, Andre is a software tools engineer at typeform.com, and he's going to present his presentation is about testing your C CI pipeline. Uh, I hope I we will be see. able to. Yeah, we can okay. see it. Perfect. Everything's perfect. Thank you. So let's start this. Uh, thanks for joining the session today. Uh, we'll be talking about testing your CI pipeline. As uh, it was already mentioned, my name is Andre. I help engineers at Typhoon to build a stable, fast, and reliable software by creating tools which make their day-to-day -day lives easier. And I like to share my thoughts uh, and ideas and reflection over the IT world with a specific uh, focus on quality um, through my blog. I am also super happy to be here today and to continue to do this, especially uh, around the Central European community, which I definitely a huge fan of. Uh, and I'm happy to, to, to be here today again. And yeah, in my free time, I like to explore the world of cooking, uh, beer brewing, and when we can also, I like to explore like the map. Um, I hope by the end of this presentation and by the end of this talk, you'll get a good grip on these topics. Uh, although they are not so old as the floppy disk, it's important to understand where our modern CI solution come from. And why we haven't thought of testing them before. Uh, I know that that could look pretty scary and it shouldn't because we are QAs and we have superpowers and we can test everything. Uh, so there's nothing super new here in this presentation, you'll see, and I'll show you how to do, uh, how to test this, this pipeline. But before we start, uh, I would like to ask you a question um, that you can answer by typing in the, in the chat. Um, What's the first CI tool you have ever used that you remember? I'm curious to see what uh, people are Andre, answering. Most people are on um, on streams. If they could type it into the Q and A in Slido. Okay. We see. Oh, we see Perfect. three Jenkins, Team City. We can see. Okay, we can see Jenkins, Team City. Uh, let me check in Slido, maybe. Nothing yet in Slido. Oh, hold on, my, maybe my fault. No, nothing in Slido, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, yeah, definitely um, uh, Jenkins is one of the first that I have worked uh, with uh, in the beginning of my, uh, my adventure around the CI world. Um, and uh, Team City as well is one of the first first CI tools that are out there. And this is a bit what we are going to talk about in the beginning of this presentation. How did we arrive to the uh, to our modern CI tools that we use today? And I know that it's uh, kind of getting Christmas now, and watching this movie is like a, a family tradition around many countries right now. No. Uh, some of us maybe have even grown up with this movie. Uh, well, I didn't put this just by chance here. So uh, it's around the original release date of this movie that sometime uh, that some engineers started to mention the possibility of working towards a very fuzzy concept. So this very fuzzy concept was continuous integration. Uh, most probably as a 90s kid, I'm not the proper person to talk about history of the IT world or the CA tools or at least yet. Uh, but uh, I suppose everything, and we can could agree here, everything started with some sort of script, no? And with a series of them. Uh, they will help us compile, execute the application and run some tests and put maybe this application somewhere that is accessible for others. Um, while looking for this particular image, but also for the previous one, I've realized that it's kind of hard to find old stuff uh, over our search engine. So this is the oldest screenshot I could find of Cruise Control. Uh, it's one of the first CI tools out there. Um, yes, it was around the beginning of the 2000s where actually the CI tools started to get super popular. So you can see from the design actually that uh, we are talking here about the uh, uh, first tool. Um, and 
all of the previous efforts like cruise control uh, led to some highly adopted first generation CI tools uh, that you all recognize and might even use today. Like uh, I've seen Thomas or Michal or Peter, they mentioned Jenkins, they mentioned Team City. Um, these tools were revolutionary and uh, let's see what the main characteristics were. So first, um, the idea behind uh, it, it was that they should create jobs that preferred certain operation, like building, testing, deploying, and so on. And connecting these jobs together, uh, it will create a chain, which is called a pipeline, a CACD pipeline. Uh, these tools were extendable by a certain number of plugins that, uh, plugins that help us to do much more than the initial software was doing. Like, for example, thinking about some funny uh, plugin, it was the famous Chuck Norris one. Uh, back in the days when Chuck Norris was a famous meme. And it was telling us uh, even more visually that if a build has failed, uh, we are maybe in trouble because nobody wanted to um, mess up with Chuck Norris, right? And the approach was pretty straightforward. Um, it, everything was configurable by via the UI, which was very easy. Um, easy, but at the same time, could have been a bit painful because you need to do a lot of copy paste. No, you uh, build your script in local. If it works, then you paste it in Jenkins. Then maybe it doesn't work there because it's not the same machine, uh, and and so on. We all know the story. And, and yeah, I think I would be rich by now if I had a dollar for every time I've said, uh, hey. Uh, we need to clean up those Jenkins jobs. Uh, the way that these tools, uh, not just Jenkins, but also the first generation of tools were designed was that was making it kind of impossible not to end up with a lot of them. And uh, these tools were hosted by the organization using them like on premise, uh, not, not on cloud. Uh, there was no reference of the code of the CI tool, just the CI tool was able to discover the code base, but not the other way around. And uh, these tools um, also might handle some logic with some ifs here and there. Um, so uh, this was generally it, the picture of the first first generation. Uh, melancholy is <laughs> pretty great, but actually I think uh, not really everything regarding the first generation was uh, uh, super great. Definitely it was it was a, a very nice set of tools that were revolutionary, uh, but some of the things could be improved. Before we continue, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, one thing. Are you using multiple CI tools in your, uh, in your project? Uh, feel free to ask this via the uh, Slido or via the meeting chat. Nothing on Slido so far. Many, many, many organizations use multiple, um, multiple um, CI tools for their project, and some of them you just choose uh, one. They are more standardized. I'm curious to know what are the people thinking. Uh, Richard is saying no. They are using just one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas is saying that enough headaches uh, with with one, just one. Peter, nice. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I've seen that usually organizations which are are spanned their project to our uh, uh, with towards that had uh, projects when the first generation appeared seem to have some older projects also in uh, in uh, older CI. Uh, CI tools, uh, so that's why that's why we um, we are using multiple uh, tools sometimes in our organization rather than maybe newer organization or newer project just focus on using one, no? getting the job done. Thanks for thanks for uh, answering this question, uh, all of you. Uh, let's go back. So then the second generation came with uh, to improve a couple of things. Uh, first, the CI tool would inspect the repositories in ACT if a certain YML file is found. So this was amazing because it meant that we already started to have pipelines as code. Um, 
Another very nice thing about the second generation was that it was very smart. So if you didn't specify a YML file or anything, it would more or less figure out what to do with your project. Like imagine you have a Java, uh, a Java project written in Groovy, you have a Groovy file over there, you don't specify what to do. If you plug it in in one of these tools, it would have directly like tried to do a, um, a build in uh, with it, no, right? Uh, so it would do some commands in that ecosystem. Um, this was uh, started, they started to be a cloud hosted solution, although they were also offering some uh, on-premise solutions for more enterprise like kind of customers. And this one like lives in every project. This might sound confusing because I've just said that pipeness as code is an advantage, no? Imagine that you have 1000 repositories in your organization and every one of them has a small file saying what pipeline and how to go to production, no? Uh, this is not super convenient uh, because you don't have a huge overview of what's happening with your pipeline that go to production. And um, we still have the configuration. Uh, we have the configuration inside the repository, but the tool and the execution is still outside. No, like for example, we use GitHub, and then we have Travis doing it. So we might have integration fails, uh, so on and so on, uh, that we might not like. And with the arrival of these tools, um, the engineering world started to um, see much more logic uh, handled by a deployment frequency. Like for example, at Typeform, we are uh, sent some deployment events uh, to count a metric, which is called deployment frequency. And depending on the type of the repository uh, that is set up with some metadata, it will send some events or others. Uh, because we are interested to see this deployment uh, frequency in different ways. So this is kind of logic that started to become part of the second generation. And these three last things that I've uh, uh, just mentioned are, from my understanding, what the third generation of CI tools are trying to solve. So these are still developing right now, uh, but there are still some solutions out there. Are already some solutions out there that are shaping this uh, third generation. So. Um, for example, a tool like CodeFresh is attempting a common uh, slash organizational wide pipelines that are controlled by a certain metadata. So what does it mean? Uh, one pipeline to deploy to production, but with various logic, depending on, for example, what version of Java you are in, if it's a um, service or a web app, if the project is marketed as legacy or not, uh, so on. No? So different outcomes, but one pipeline. Uh, this set of tools, uh, Bitbucket Pipelines, uh, GitHub Actions, CICD, they are telling us one thing. They say directly, I live, I live to where next to your code lives, and I want to get as close as possible to that. Why? To improve execution times, to improve fast feedback, so on. Um, and um, both of these tools, uh, CodeFresh and as well uh, as uh, GitHub Actions, help to build the uh, reusable steps that can be plugged in uh, into your pipelines. These are small pieces of software that have some logic, like for example, to create a new in Jira, to send an SMS at some point in the pipeline, uh, to upload some files into an S3 bucket, like uh, a report. And um, they have even created a community back marketplace, so uh, it's even easier to browse, choose whatever small piece of software you, you might need. And if it's not there, you can create it, you can make it. As you can see, this third generation is aiming pretty high and it's attempting to solve some problems that were coming even from generation one. Now, I say don't play so much board games as I did in the past. And maybe you are wondering why I even put this uh, here. Um, because it's simple, because testing is like a, it's like a game of risk. Uh, it didn't make much sense to test the pipelines in generation one and two, because simply the risk that we had uh, associated with not testing was pretty low. Um, and with their failure in general was pretty low. We could argue that they were simple sequential operations that uh, if broken could be easily fixed with maybe changing one environment variable or it was something related more with the infrastructure. Um, and you might say, I'm confused. Uh, what makes then generation three so much different? Don't worry, I'm going to explain this uh, throughout 
few examples. Then we will go to the more practical part. I will show you how to do it. Um, let's have a look first at how a common pipeline for an organization would practically behave. So we have a pipeline. Uh, we have a defined a YML file inside the, the first code base. Um, explaining this is a web app written in React uh, with JavaScript, has some functional depth with WebDriver IO, and the canary strategy for releasing this if successful. This is um, this is metadata is configurable, so anything that you configure in the pipeline to read, you can you can have inside your um, um, this YML file. So take this as an example. You can you can personalize as as you want here, and we have a very similar one that uh, uh, for for another code base that is written in Angular has uh, some functional tests with Cypress uh, this time, and what's a different canary strategy. These files tells the pipeline to do stuff, and the pipeline will do it. This means that the pipeline has some sort of internal logic that knows what to do in all of these small cases, no? And in this, it's able to do some basic decision-making uh, in order to do that. Now, imagine we release a new version of the pipeline, which both of these code bases will rely. Is there any risk of potentially breaking one of these pipelines? I'd say yes, and if we don't test it, uh, we might not know straight ahead, and that's where some extra help, uh, test could help. But you'll say, if pipelines are simple, I just need to build, test, and deploy, uh, nothing much more. And actually, if you, <laughs> you, you'll be right, because this is the picture of generation one, no? We, we do build, test, and deploy, nothing much more. Uh, but pipelines nowadays started to become more complex, are not so simple. They start to do some decision making, like for example, which level of tests to run, just the unit or also the end-to-end? -end? Um, is there an event, uh, all the tests, like for example, or just the minimal set of tests for this kind of uh, feature? Uh, is there an event in the code freeze calendar? uh that i might want to be aware of and hold the deploy uh, because i don't want to impact uh, customers or business in an important date is there any jira ticket that uh, um, i should update the results with, of the test with um, is this flagged as an important uh, release like a major release maybe i need to alert customer success um, with so they start to uh, know if there's a problem um, how to react if people report it, right? And for example, which kind of software did I just deploy? So I can send this deployment event to my uh, metrics dashboard and populate it. As you can see, all of this is logic. And how many combinations do we have in the previous uh, schema in order to test? Uh, I don't have my calculator with me, and I think uh, there's so many methodologies to, to figure out that, and I, but I would just say that a lot, no? Uh, my point here is that there's a risk associated with not testing. Okay, so still, why do we need to test? We have a high risk of breaking the pipelines and having them broken in moments that we are not aware. And secondly, our deployment pipelines are a production tool. Imagine that we need to do an emergency uh, deploy and we have a failing pipeline because some small change in one of these small functionalities that I've just mentioned, and this is stopping a critical risk to go to production. You say, okay, I will just start unit testing. I will uh, this logic here and there, and that's that's fine. And actually, I hope you already do it because this is small pieces of software that you have over there, right? Uh, you should be doing that. Uh, and if you're not doing, please do. But this is not really the point of this uh, this presentation today, and I'll show you why. Let's come back to this common pipeline to understand even better my point. Um, Let's imagine that the no-code fleece block over here, it's like an external step, um, for example, the ones that you can put from GitHub or Codefresh, that is developed by another organization that maybe doesn't do unit tests or doesn't have a good uh, quality process or culture uh, inside their place. Or maybe it's a unique developer that uh, did this in their free time and is sometimes maintaining it, but not with the most uh, better technology and the better processes. And uh, they pushed the version two release uh, that uh, your organization see and say, ah, this uh, step never gave me a problem. There should not be any problem. Let's uh, upgrade the version for everyone. And if uh, we are with the latest of this no code uh, freeze. 
and suddenly somebody starts to release and the pipeline breaks for them and it looks like uh, murphy's law no everybody wants to do uh, uh deploy in that exact moment it's not a very nice moment to uh to to uh, to be in if you are uh, handling the pipeline no and you need to make the pipeline working for the whole organization um so coming coming back in in the past i've attended uh one talk about uh, of this guy dan garfield and he was mentioning so this that kind of made me shock at the moment so as the complexity of the infrastructure raises the usefulness of testing early decreases so this is interesting, but how is this relevant for this talk and for the point that I was just main, uh, mentioning? We need a strong base. That's we need a higher level of test to help us identify other possible issues our software can have. In this case, our software is the CA pipeline. So testing early will help us. Uh, testing at the unit uh, level will help us, but we need to test at the higher level to see how this pipeline could behave in case somebody is triggering it in order to avoid the to avoid problems. Nusef, that's uh, pretty hardcore. Uh, and yet another speaker comes to me and tells, ah, I need to do more testing without providing me a specific tool. And please don't tell me uh, that's easy. Um, but suddenly it is pretty easy. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, how, how to do it. But before I do that, I will ask you uh, one last question. Which testing methods is the easiest to start with? Is it black box, white box, and gray box? Think about you are starting a new project. It's your first day and you need to do execute one test case uh, that you obviously create. Which one, these ones, will you uh, find easier to, uh, to do? Please answer in the chat or in the Slido. I'm uh, following the uh, Slido. I think we have a question that I can answer further on from 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 Peppa. Let like I saying uh, black box and Richard as well. Uh, it says uh, black box. Um, Julia is saying black box. Peter says I don't know. Uh, don't be afraid. Just uh, the one you feel more comfortable with. says black box. Cool. Um, this was a bit kind of my uh, my point that I wanted to make here. Um, we are all very familiar with uh, black box and when we don't know something, it's easier to start with it. Uh, the same concept applies when testing CI pipelines at the higher level. So we need somehow to be able to give some inputs, uh, abstract ourselves from what's inside and check the outputs. Um, obviously, what's inside this was already unit testing. Um, so let's look at an example that I have worked on creating a couple of months ago, uh, where we created a commonly shared GitHub action that can be a step in any pipeline. So this, uh, as I was explaining, this is a small piece of software that uh, connects with the Google Calendar and tells us if in that moment of the execution, if the calendar is busy or not. So this, this Small action can be plugged in, in any pipeline. So we have this GitHub action and we want to test that uh, that what's inside our black box. And this is what we previously know about it. And apart from it, we know that our inputs are this. We have two token variables that are some credentials uh, for Google APIs. And we have a calendar ID to be checked. On the right side, uh, uh, right side uh, we have the output. So the output is a Boolean. It's uh, uh, telling us if the calendar is busy or not, true or false. And we want to test this scenario. Um, if a calendar has no event in that very moment, our action will return false. And I've re just written this with Gherkin because I'm a huge fan of it. Um, so what do we need? to 
be able to automate this scenario of this small part of a pipeline. First of all, we need a very basic understanding of what is uh, a GitHub, what is GitHub Actions, and how does it more or less work. So, uh, if you go to GitHub, apart from being a fancy new button in the GitHub repository menu, it is a way to automate workflows or pipelines such as testing, static code analysis, deploying to production, and more. So whatever this is relevant for your software delivery life cycle. And these uh, pipelines live in the point github slash workflows folders, uh, where you can define various YMLs uh, with the workflows to be uh, performed, as you can see uh, here in the screenshot. Um, and inside this YML file, you can define when to execute it, uh, the steps you need to specify what in the steps you need to face, specify what GitHub actions you want to reuse, and um, here's for example what um, um, reuse um, what an example of how Hero World pipeline will look like. You can see it's not very different from how a Travis uh, YML file is looking like, or okay maybe a Jenkins file is a groovy script, but it's not super different. It's just way of putting some blocks of uh, sequential information. Um, coming back to what we need. So uh, first, we need to generate some test data for the WAN. We need some tokens for the Google API, and then we need an empty calendar. So whenever the check runs, we can always receive false. And on the second uh, part, we need a way to assert that output. Uh, and when I was looking to test, uh, this scenario, when I was building this, I was looking to test this scenario, I couldn't find anything on GitHub that could help me with this very problem. So I came up with this GitHub action that allows you to do assertions. So it's a super basic piece of software that is using Chai in the back to do assertions. It's not complete, but it's it's like extendable. Um, you can plug in any other use cases that it has and ping me in the repo, or if you need to make any change, do a PR. Uh, I leave the link in the end of the description so uh, you can you can look at it. Uh, this is abbreviated GAT, which in my adoption country's language, Catania means uh, cat. You will see that it uh, prints out some funny emojis as well in the uh, console. Uh, so this this small piece of software has three inputs that is will be helping us to assert uh, our pipeline. Firstly, the assertion: what do we want to do? For example, a should equal. What's the expected value, uh, true, for example, or the actual value, the one that I received from executing the pipeline? Uh, it's as well, uh, for example, can be true, no? If these three things are not aligned, then this uh, fails because the criteria is not met. So let's test this. Uh, the test itself would be a GitHub action pipeline with two steps, one for each steps of the scenario. So the, the first one, this is for the when part, no? As you can see here, we have the uses, which means that I'm checking the same repository, checking out the same repository I'm executing this in. So if I'm, this helps me use um, to use this scenario while I'm building um, this repository, while I'm improving this repository. Uh, this can be used as well in other uh, other repositories um, uh, to, in order to test. Uh, the ID, I give this step an ID to reference it later for the output. You'll see why. Um, I'm using the double brackets for, uh, and the dollar uh, dollar sign um, in reference for the GitHub secret. So I have added this these inputs. I have added them as secrets because this repository is public, and I didn't want to make public the calendar ID that we are using at Typeform and the uh, API credentials. Uh, definitely for for other pieces of software, you can have this uh, public. For example, if your software just uh, makes a, a, a small calculation or or you need to give two inputs that could be an integer or can be a string from the from from the uh, YML file, you can definitely get that from uh, uh, from from there. Uh, and uh, for the then part, I'm using the GitHub action tester and I make the assertion uh, that should equal false uh, with the uh, output step. As you can see, I, I'm referencing here the ID steps point CS the outputs calendar busy. So this is the output. So enough about talking. Let's do some. Um, um, let's see this. How is this is running in uh, in in real? 
in a in a real uh, in in GitHub and how this can help us uh, in the real solution. So I will stop sharing my screen uh, this and I will share again. this screen as you can see i'm in the repository that i have mentioned uh what i'm going to do uh i'm going to show you that here in the github workflows we have the uh test yml file that helps us to test it's exactly the same file they have just uh, uh showed you i have some extra uh, variables that are not mandatory and which i i didn't want to uh introduce in the presentation not to over confuse you um and what I will be testing is exactly the same, uh, the, sa the same scenario. So uh, a happy path that returns false. How do we run it? As you can see here, I'm running this on a push, uh, on a push or on a pull request to master. So let's do a small pull request, uh, a, a very easy one. I will do something that will not break the. I will update with me. So I will add some free, a few white spaces. I will create a new branch. I'll say um, components, propose changes. And I'm creating a pull request. As you can see, and this is the main advantage of this third generation tools, is that this third, uh, these tests are already queued. They will be executing in like uh, no time. This is already in progress. And we will see some, some this was successful. Let's go there to see what happened. Um, we have, as we're saying, uh, we have when a calendar with no events is checked. So we were running our piece of software with the credentials, with the Google Calendar ID, with the other optional things. And we see that the calendar is not busy. And then we make the assertion. Uh, so we have made the assertion with should equal, uh, expected false, actual uh, false. So I'm running GAT and the cut of uh, GAT after mailing, it's saying that the test has passed. So uh, how is this helping us? Uh, well, it's pretty easy because if I would be right now making a pull request, uh, breaking this, um, uh, breaking the execution of, uh, of, of this, I know that whoever is using this uh, piece of software in their call will have troubles. And by having a small piece of uh, uh, test suite at this level of this uh, of this pipeline, whoever might be using this uh, uh, in their tool is much more assured uh, of uh, of the 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 the, um, of the quality of this uh, of this uh, of the software that they are using. So they will have less trouble. This is what I was planning to show you uh, regarding this. I will come back to the presentation to. Hope uh, you are able to see. Yep, we can see. It. Yeah, thanks for uh, for confirming. Um, nice. So, what do we need to do to uh, enable teams to uh, test CI pipeline? I'd say first of all, we need to work on testability. Uh, what does it mean? We need at least to have a certain way to give inputs and check outputs and. Let's be honest, nowadays our pipelines are not that great at doing neither of these. So in order to be able to test them, we will need to improve uh, the way that we, um, we, 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 we are analyzing the inputs and outputs and, and the testability here. As well as we need somewhere to test. Like obviously the example that I have showed you is very simple, no? Uh, it's not a deployment. It's not something that uh, might affect users and, and, and so on. It's something that can be easily isolated, but we might need discardable environments where we could test our pipelines uh, in order to, to, to do this. As well as we need to raise awareness into the testing community that this is a topic to tackle from, from now on. Um, and as a testing community, let's start building more tools for this. That is something that is small, can be used just with GitHub Actions, but what about other, maybe more complex situations? Yeah, talking about tools, uh, these are uh, this is a set of tools that can help you build your pipelines with more quality. But as you can see, most of them are focused on being able to run them in local. So 
mano like manually, which is still good, but it's not, let's say it's not enough. If you are more of a hacker or more of a techie person, um, you can orchestrate these tools with a Docker container, for example, and then be able to execute some uh, assertions automatically and check if these pipelines are working or not. Um, then it's very interesting. Uh, the last one, the unit test Jenkins pipeline, it's very interesting because um, it's actually a bit more close to uh, the point that we are trying to make today in this presentation. Uh, apart from it, what about the rest? This is upon us to, to, to work and build. Um, sum up. Um, I think this would, the sum up here is pretty straightforward. So um, pipelines are software. And the complexity of pipelines have raised um, from in the last um, in, in the last years. So because of the tools that enable uh, them, uh, like the CI tools, but also uh, because of the increasing logic that we are enabled to add to the pipelines. Uh, and subsequently, now we have much more risk associated with changing something in the pipeline, and that's why nowadays we need to also test these pieces of software, which uh, we need to uh, be uh, testing at a higher level, not just at unit test level. Um, we need a few powerful high level uh, tests that are helping us to, to bring this confidence uh, into us and um, be aware of potential uh, problems. And there are some tools out there um, now that like GAT, for example, that they could help you or you just seen, but um, let's build more, uh, let's use them and let's contribute to them. Let's make this a topic in our uh, uh, part of the industry. And uh, I would like to thank you, I would say Mutsumensk for being here today. On the right side, you'll see my contact, uh, how to reach me out in, in LinkedIn. I've uh, I'd like to be in touch with you and if you have any questions after even after this uh, the open discussion uh, uh, in the coffee room and in the Slido, please contact me. You have the GitHub uh, repository uh, of the um, GitHub action tester that you can access, you can start it, uh, um, you can pull request, uh, feel free to use. And on the left uh, left side, I would ask I would like to ask you some feedback. Um, how did you feel about my presentation today? and how can I improve and how can I improve that? If you have any thoughts, please scan the QR code or just access the, uh, the link and I'm happy to, uh, uh, happy to answer your, uh, your questions. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much. I'm going to, there's three questions on Slido, so I'm just going to present the questions and tell me when you can see them. Perfect. Yeah, so first question from Pepper, what reporting tools are you using to collect your data logs from pipeline execution? What do you evaluate apart from test execution results? Uh, for example, what we are um, using at Typeform is um, um, a solution that, uh, a metric solution that is uh, Datadog. So we are sending some events to Datadog in order to be able to, to know what kind of uh, problems we have in our pipeline and what's the general um, let's say status of our uh, deployment uh, 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 pipelines. However, we are not we are not um, looking at that so much. And I think uh, I think this would be a very interesting topic for uh, the third generation of CI tools because neither of the first generation, neither the second one, didn't provide us any kind of metrics of how our pipeline uh, could look at uh, could look at us um what we could improve in them are they taking too long or too less and already companies like travis or uh like especially the cloud, cloud solutions like github ha have already industry information and know uh, for example how much a pipeline could take uh how much a test um, a, a test step should take how much a unit test step should take that could based on that huge amount of big data that they are already, I, I suppose, already gathering, they could provide us improvement points to uh, to our uh, delivery, right? So I think um, right now, uh, what do you evaluate apart, uh, apart from the test execution results? Uh, not really much, I would say, uh, just the execution, uh, the execution, uh, let's say, uh, time, because we are using some pipelines in GitHub and the pricing, um, the pricing model, it's on minutes. So 
right now we are starting to uh, make some operational changes to make it more efficient. Uh, we don't have any more these persistent jobs as we were having in Jenkins uh, at some points in the past. Um, but I think getting more metrics with this, this is what I think is if anybody is here from the enterprise tools or whatever, start building it because you'll get rich. Uh, <laughs> next one from Martin. Can you briefly describe the difference between Jenkins pipeline, Jenkins file, and Git, uh, GitHub Actions? Thank you. So uh, they are basically uh, the same thing. You have a file in your in your uh, in your at, at a very high level. They are this, more or less the same thing. Uh, you have a file in your um, um, in, in your repository that controls the execution of uh, one uh, one step, uh, one step, one um, one one pipeline. Uh, the Jenkins files is written in Groovy. Um, it has some much more, let's say, flexibility in this sense. It lives inside the Jenkins, um, let's say, ecosystem and is able to perform under Jenkins. And so basically, GitHub Actions, but the same as in in in, in GitHub. So I would say they, they do similar stuff, but they're just um, um, this particular two details. They are very, uh, let's say, uh, very similar, but they do uh, similar stuff. What is very interesting here, it's um, what Jenkins and GitHub do differently, right? So Jenkins is the most, um, let's say, more on-premise solution. Uh, the other one is on cloud. Jenkins is, let's say, outside a bit of uh, the, your repository. If you are using GitHub, maybe you are interested to have faster feedback, uh, so on and so on. Um, there's uh, different aspects where different tools in the market provide you uh, advantages over the other one. Uh, and yeah, this follows up with uh, which CI CD is better, GitHub or GitLab? I mean, uh, the, the best CI CD is uh, the one that is the most stable one for you uh, and the one that doesn't break production. So in the end, these are tools, and this is uh, another point of my presentation. No, we could choose whatever. In the end, what the most important thing is arriving to production safely. And now, since this kind of tools started to empower more, you know, like these unique pipelines, this way to plug in more stuff, uh, it's important that we start to test more, no, and to be aware that this could fail and could we can have a a, a big bang uh, of a failure that we don't realize about it. So. GitLab, they have their own models that are different, um, uh, so on, so on. Um, mm, if you are looking at um, starting uh, uh, an open source project, maybe GitHub is more friendly uh, with that. Uh, they offer you more, uh, let's say, free freeware stuff. GitLab is uh, more of a small company uh, built by more, let's say, honest uh, kind of uh, uh, interest. Uh, if you are into that, you can also evaluate maybe uh, functionality of a very uh, yeah. big corporation. Discussion can go uh, on and on. Yeah. I was frightened that, that this would start a long discussion because this is one of these questions that always sparks some, some, some let's say, heated debate. Uh, I've just uh, maybe got a final question or point of which got one minute. Uh, in discussions with people who are building infrastructure in cloud, these are operational guys. These are the ops guys that got into DevOps. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned in your slide building awareness. So people who are building the pipeline are probably the developers. They might be the operational guys. What's the challenge or how do you overcome that challenge of getting them to be aware that what they're building actually needs some testing? Do you have some quick advice? That, that's a very interesting thing, and uh, that's uh, that's why I'm actually here, uh, because uh, we are at the beginning with this, and we are, uh, you know, like even even when you see the um, videos with the Spotify model and all of this, you now that they you present, you know, you present an ideal state. Actually, this uh, this here it's an ideal state as well. No, we would like to be a, become to that point that. We are so close to ops that we also are telling ops, hey, your pipelines, like, uh, you know, like you are building it and looks like it's kind of, no, you know, uh, improvable. Uh, we're not there. We're not there. And we are because we are neither have the tools um, and we didn't 
seem to have the need up until this moment. No? So mm -hmm. right now we kind of start to have the need. Um, we start to have this kind of presentation like mine. Uh, and let's let's build this culture uh, together. Yeah. But even, even those operation guys come to people like us and say, hey, we've realized we're building things through code now. We need help with testing. So I think even from their side, they're starting to realize that there's a there's risk involved in what they're doing. Okay, Andre, thank you very much.